our next discussion, we're very happy to welcome some of our members of our Patient Advisory Council for what we're calling a fireside chat. I will confirm we're not set a fire within the Faculty of Medicine. We've had to remove that. So our fireside chat will be facilitated by our patient engagement lead, Julia Burt. So we have four of our patient partners joining us today. I'm just going to take a minute to introduce them all. First up is Tony Lehman. As a 22 year old, Tony wants to bring the youth perspective to conversations on healthcare through the lens of a patient and a Bachelor of Nursing student. She is a member of the Newfoundland Support Patient Advisory Council, as well as, as well as the newly appointed chair of the Canadian Medical Association's Patient Voice Group. We're very proud of her for getting that chair position. In this position, she ensures the needs and opinions of the younger generation are reflected. Coming from a small town of 4,000 in Newfoundland and Labrador, she shares the talent challenges of accessing care in a rural community and is an advocate for accessible, affordable and equitable virtual care for everyone. Next, Mike Warren is a retired employee of the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, having last held the position of, of ADM policy and planning in the former Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Mike has been a patient partner and member of NL Supports PAC for five and a half years. He's completed training in patient-oriented research, including formation of patient research partnerships and effective patient engagement. Since joining us, Mike has been an advisor and partner on many patient-oriented activities. I'm not going to go through the list, it's quite long. And one of Mike's main patient partner activities has been research on the application of case management as a treatment option for patients with chronic and complex conditions. Next is Rosemary Lester, previously the Executive Director of Seniors NL. Rosemary joined NL Support's Patient Advisory Council when it was first established in 2015. So she's really been with us from the beginning. She's been actively engaged in patient-oriented research, including the unit's inaugural patient-initiated research project, which focuses on the impacts of COVID-19 isolation on residents in long-term care. And lastly, but by no means least, we have Chris Carter. Chris is a patient representative on the Newfoundland Support Patient Advisory Council and is involved in a variety of patient partner activities locally and nationally. She's engaged in a patient partner with several diabetes research projects and is also a member of the research team in the patient initiated project on the impacts of COVID-19 on long-term care residents here in the province. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to Julia to begin the panel discussion. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Catherine. I know we're speaking on behalf of all the patient partners that we're quite excited to be here and, and talk about NL Supports Patient Advisory Council and the important role that patient partners play in health research. So Tony, why don't I, I start with you? Can you tell us what exactly is the Patient Advisory Council or is what we like to call the PAC? Yeah, thanks so much for asking, Julia. Um, I'm so excited to talk about our PAC and what we do today. So we're a group of up to about 25 people of all ages, backgrounds, and we're from all over the province. We have so many passions and areas of expertise, making our whole group a wealth of knowledge on being patients and caregivers in our healthcare system. Our most important role as a PAC is giving guidance and advice on the work of Newfoundland support, quality of care Newfoundland, and choosing wisely Newfoundland. We consult on things like patient-oriented research priorities, the engagement of patients in research projects, and planned public outreach activities. For an example, um, in the coming weeks, some of our members are going to be advising on funding priorities for the Newfoundland Support Educational Grants, which many students here at MON have actually applied for. That's awesome. And uh, as you can see, we also participate in events like this to get the word out about our awesome group. Thanks, Tony. I mean, I, I've only been with NL Support for less than a year, but I'm constantly amazed at the breadth of activity that, that you guys are all involved in. It, it's really great. So do patient partners um, get access to opportunities outside of the pack as well? Yes, of course. Um, if there's something that you're looking for, I can absolutely guarantee that it's out there for you, and the pack will certainly help you get there. Many of our members are active patient partners on health research teams. Um, they network to promote patient engagement across Canada and internationally, participate in workshops and conferences, and so much more. I could go on for hours. In my personal experience, um, because of the PAC, 
as um, Catherine said, I have become the chair of the Canadian Medical Association's first patient group, The Patient Voice. And I've also had the opportunity to collaboratively author an article with Mike, one of our other members here today, Holly Echigari, who is our academic uh, patient engagement lead with the unit, and many others um, on the role of patient advisory councils in health research. That was really exciting for me. Um, we were even published in the Journal of Patient Experience, so great experience. Um, I wouldn't have even dreamed of these incredible opportunities if it wasn't for the PAC. Of course, thanks, Tony. And I think, you know, especially for you as a student, you have your whole career ahead of you. You know, getting these experiences now are incredibly valuable for you. That, that's wonderful. Definitely. So one final question um, that I think will summarize things quite nicely. Why are patient partners so important? Um, I think that patient partners are valuable members of healthcare research, te research teams and patient advisory groups. Our lived experiences and personal healthcare journeys bring important perspectives to the table, perspectives that are unfortunately often left out. As the receivers of care, patients know what is needed to achieve quality, accessible, and equitable healthcare. So why not use this as a valuable resource? If nothing else, we hope you'll listen to our voices, ideas, and passion, because ultimately we are here to advocate for every single patient in our province. So as they say, nothing about us without us. And I just want to thank everybody um, for listening to my little spiel on the pack. <laughs> if you have any questions about us or being a patient partner, please reach out to me at any time. I'd be happy um, to answer those, as I'm sure any other member would. And we would love to have you join us. Thank you so much, Tony. I think that was a, a really helpful explanation about the pack and, and you know, why patient partners are so important in health research. Now thank move you. Along to, <laughs> thanks. So move, I'll move on to, to Mike now. Mike, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about your role on the Patient Advisory Council and a bit about your work um, in some patient-oriented research. I think Catherine mentioned the work on your case management pro uh, project as well. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning from Mount Pearl. No fireplace, no comfy uh, armchair, no glass of wine or a coffee, but uh, hopefully a lot of uh, helpful information. Uh, in my few minutes, I'd like to focus on three things. One is uh, my uh, experience on the PAC, the Patient Advisory Council, uh, and uh, what I've learned over the years from coming in uh, five, five years ago. And uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about a major project that I've been involved in, a research project. And uh, as an example of the kinds of things that a patient partner, a patient advisor can do in, in research, on research projects. And last, based on all the experience I've gained over the last five years, uh, uh, offer my uh, suggestions on ways to increase the value of uh, patient partners in research. So first, the Patient Advisory Council, uh, what I've liked. I've liked contributing to research priorities, the work to uh, identify priorities uh, with others, uh, being part of a sounding board for researchers. I really like that. That's pretty good. Researchers come in and ask us as patients for our advice, suggestions on uh, how they should uh, undertake their research. I've liked sharing and learning about important research that's happening in the province and elsewhere. I really like participating in research. Applied research is my big interest. And uh, I've also liked knowledge translation activities with the audience being the, uh, the general public. And uh, that's a big bonus for researchers to have that, that addition to the research, that, to move the research out to the public in, in our case. Another one I've liked is helping educate new and future uh, researchers. I've done a few projects and a few activity, activities uh, uh, through MUN to educate some, uh, some new researchers and future researchers. And I've also liked working with dedicated patient partners, like the ones here today, uh, as well as researchers. Something I haven't liked, and I, I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this, but I haven't liked, and it's not really a, a, a PAC issue, more so as a research issue. Uh, I haven't liked when you put so much effort and work into developing proposals and you don't get funded. That's been, I've had to adjust to that, <laughs> but that's a reality and I'm sure uh, researchers would, would understand that, that view. Okay, a few minutes to talk about the case management program. It's a major partnership uh, between several provinces and institutions. It's also known as PRICARE. 
It follows the principles of Canada's SPORE framework. Some key features of the case management program are, it's an intervention designed to improve the outcomes for patients with chronic complex conditions who are frequent users of healthcare resources. It's also about improving the efficiency and effectiveness in healthcare. More specifically, the study team is examining how, for who, and under what conditions case management can be used to help patients. The case management intervention has four main components that a case manager, often a nurse, leads in collaboration with the patient. Evaluation of the patient needs, co-development and maintenance of a patient-centered service care plan, coordination of services between the partners, the professionals, and education and self-management support for patients and their families. Very quickly, the case management program in numbers, 15 researchers, coordinators, and assistants, nine patient partners, five provinces are participating, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, and of course, Newfoundland and Labrador, a five, oh, sorry, $2 million budget. The timeline is 2018 to 23. It's been extended because of COVID. There are 94 patients that are recruited into the program, plus an additional 62 have received the intervention. There are seven participating clinics, two of which are in this province, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. For the Newfoundland uh, component, I work closely with Chris Aubrey and Dana House of the Primary Care Research Unit. And I have to say, it's been a very positive experience. Now, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes just to share some thoughts. Based on uh, my research partnerships uh, with uh, folks uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, in other provinces, uh, and my conversations with the researchers uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, of course, uh, other provinces, other countries, uh, participate in, in conferences, uh, the uh, the uh, SPORE Summit in 2018. So uh, after all of that experience, uh, I've come to the conclusion myself that there is one truism for me, and here's the big reveal. Patient partners add value to healthcare research. It's easy to understand. Now, the objective, I believe, is for uh, all of us to work to maximize the value that patient partners bring to the research partnership. And I'll offer some suggestions for considerations. Patient partners and researchers should have training in patient-oriented research and patient engagement. Patient partners should be recruited very carefully to make sure they're a good fit with the project. You just don't want the warm body to meet the requirements of the, uh, of the call for proposals. Patient partners should also look for a good fit. If they're gonna make a commitment, they should make sure that the project is right for them. Next, when recruiting, patient partners' full experience, both within the healthcare system and outside the healthcare system, should be considered. Often, and I've seen it a lot, patient partners add that extra value through their experience as communicators, teachers, project planners, the arts, and, uh, uh, also in marketing, because research uh, findings need to be sold. It's not simply research for research. Another one is patient need, need, need to come to the research table prepared to engage. They have to show they add value. Everyone needs clear expectations of their role, the work required and their commitment. Everyone needs patience. The learning curve can be steep and often long. Good leaders and champions are critical to success, both for researchers and patient partners. And finally, patient partners should be remunerated. It recognized their, comp their contribution and value to the research. While the path has been frustrating for me on, uh, on times, Mun has led the way in creating a job spec for patient partners. To my knowledge, it's one of the first in Canada. Well done. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks a lot.
Thank you so much, Mike. Mike, I think you've painted a, a really nice picture of what we like to talk about in terms of meaningful patient engagement, right? And I think those those tips you provided at the end um, will be so helpful for patient partners as well as researchers who are, are thinking about involving patient partners in their research moving forward. So uh, thank you so much. So last but certainly not least, uh, I'll move along to Rosemary and Chris who are, are here with me today. Um, and as Catherine had mentioned, um, they're going to be talking a little bit about NL Support's first patient initiated research project. Um, and this project is, is looking at the impacts of COVID-19 restrictions on um, the physical and mental well-being of both residents and family members um, in, of long-term care facilities uh, in the province, so a bit of a mouthful. Um, but Rosemary, why don't I start with you? Can you tell us a bit about how the project came to be, where the idea came from? Well, firstly, um, if you look at the membership of PAC, the Patient Advisory Council, you can see that there are certain numbers in a certain um, demographic, <laughs> Uh, whereas this becomes quite a personal issue, a sort of me issue, as we like to say. Uh, so that's really where it started. Um, and then uh, also, because this is the first time this is patient-initiated research has come, has come through the pack and through Newfoundland support, um, I think we have to spend some time, too, figuring out our roles in this. I think that's, I, I feel that's probably still ongoing because it is a very new approach. So we initiated the project because of, um, as I say, a, a natural interest, um, but also because we were hearing a lot of stories about what was happening to residents in long-term care, especially during the lockdown. Um, we were hearing also from worried, uh, upset families and friends who were unable to visit or have contact with their relatives or friends. And um, it, I think really that, that Nobody really knew where this was going and what the effect it was having on, on both of these groups. So this led us to wonder, um, you know, is there something we can do to, um, to bring this forward and to look at uh, the good and the bad of, of it? But we also wanted to find out from experiences of those who'd experienced the death of a relative or friend uh, during the lockdown and during, and during this period because their experiences would be uh, even, even more, even different in many ways from those who are just waiting for the lockdown to, to end. So in the end, what we wanted to do is to find a way to improve the situation for both these groups, residents and families, should this situation occur again, and to identify really what was done well, because we, we don't want to say that nothing was working and nothing was helpful. But we do feel that a lot could have been done better, and uh, this this is something we can make a start at, the, at examining. Thanks, Rosemary. I think we can all agree that this is such a, a relevant and timely uh, area of research, and one that you know I hope will will inform policy and decision making, and and how long term care facilities approach you know patient centered care moving forward. Um, so, Chris, now that we know kind of the origin story of of the project, how has the project advanced? And can you tell us a little bit more about the objectives, where we are now? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, as uh, Rosemary just mentioned, um, we came up with the idea of doing this research in long-term care based on the concerns not only us, who myself and Rosemary, who are a part of the project, had, but also uh, other members of the pack as well. Um, there was a lot of concern everywhere at that time, I think. So we then agreed that uh, we would uh, get together with the uh, researchers uh, from Newfoundland Support and develop a proposal to investigate, you know, what has been going on during the lockdown with COVID and um, get that proposal done up and apply for funding to the Canadian Institute of Health Research. Um, so uh, in 2020, when all this was going on, we got that proposal together, we sent it off, but uh, unfortunately we didn't make the cut. <laughs> a lot of research projects don't make the cut, and uh, so we had to come up with another plan and uh, have another meeting. And uh, at that meeting, Newfoundland Support decided 
based, I think, on the fact that members of the of Patient Advisory Council were involved, not only us who are on the research project, but many others were very concerned about what was going on and wanted to advance this research project. So consequently, Newfoundland support um, of the leadership there said, you know, we're going to give you the resources to move ahead with this project. Uh, which we were very happy with, and uh, so they did, and so we got a team together and uh, and uh, um, decided to investigate further. Uh, so as for the objectives, as Rosemary has mentioned again, and, uh, and, and I don't want to uh, um, duplicate too much, but, you know, there's two main objectives here. One of them is to look at what happened during that lockdown, uh, to the mental and physical health of patients during, during that time. So how were they feeling before? How are they feeling after and during? And to do some comparisons so that we could get a feel for their mental and physical health prior and uh, after. But we also wanted to look at uh, the families and the visitors who were coming to their family and loved ones in long-term care and what impact did that have on them? You know, I had a friend who had a father there in long-term care who was so concerned and, um, and the restrictions were very tough on family members. Consequently, we wanted to look and see about their physical and mental health through this whole process as well. And um, in particular, you know, I'd like to just underline the isolation that uh, people on both sides of the coin, uh, excuse me, experience. And the other thing I'd like to mention that I think uh, maybe a lot of people do realize this, but family and visitors are really care, co care coordinators for their loved one. They play, they play such an important role. And, uh, and, and they also help support the staff who are there and provide better care for their loved ones. So very important role there. So anyway, all that said and done, the whole process, again, with COVID and everything else that has been going on has taken longer than uh, we would have thought. Um, but we have got it pretty well off the ground now. And uh, we're getting... Um, 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 a proposal, um, an application ready now to go to the ethics board. And we hope that we will be able to uh, proceed with the research um, very soon. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much, Chris. I know we're, we're all quite excited to see how the project evolves. And I'm sure, um, keep an eye out as I'm sure our support will be providing updates on the project through potentially webinars or a newsletter, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the fireside or the fireside chat. Um, thank you again to our patient partners for joining us today and talking about the very important topic of involving patient partners in health research. Um, we welcome any questions that anyone has on any support, our patient advisory council, patient engagement, health research, any all that sort of thing. So thank you so much again. Thank you so much, um, Tony, Mike, Chris, Rosemary, and of course Julia.